this part is just the informal part of the talk and I have 60 something slides, I think, and we will not get through all of them today and I will have more slides by the time I do the second half of the talk. So um, we're just going to get as far as we, we want today, really. So as I was saying earlier, this talk will last at most an hour um, or 55 minutes from now. And do interrupt if you have any questions. This is the rough outline. Um, so just the basic house rules and stuff. So we will then talk about pure functional programming principles. And then yeah, if there's time, we may not get any farther than that today. Um, we will go into advanced functional programming. And this is entirely my own opinion and my own based on my own experiences. I'm not a computer scientist. I'm not going through anybody's textbooks or anything. So um, if there are theorists out there, they may well disagree with me or something, which is absolutely fine. Uh, then the intention was to cover the, um, the bits where functions have side effects, so they're not actually pure functional programming functions. And then we'll go into the more theoretical stuff towards the end, uh, which we will, which I can pretty much guarantee we will not reach today, which is good because I haven't finished that bit. So um, without further ado, uh, this part of the talk is meant to be informal. So do interrupt to have, if you have any questions, we're just here to share experiences and, and learn together. And so this part of the talk is less, it's not just me talking to you. Um, we can discuss things as we go along. So I hope people are happy with that. So the general house rules are, um, do interrupt if you have any questions, because if we're covering lots of ground and you want to ask a question about a particular topic, then uh, it is best to ask while it's in your mind uh, before we move on to something completely different. And uh, there's a bit of terminology that I introduce. So if I mention inferior languages, for example, that means languages that are not Lisp, obviously. And um, we will not get to the Monad stuff later, I think. The examples are mostly Emacs Lisp, but there will be some bits where I have to use some common Lisp examples. I will mostly use them when there are functions that are all also present in Emacs Lisp, but I will choose the common Lisp ones because the Emacs Lisp functions will have constraints or limitations that hinder my, the thing that I will try to explain. So I choose, choose common Lisp examples when Emacs Lisp can't really do it, although it could do if you put some more effort into it than I have put into it. This thing is very much written in my spare time, so Sundays and lying at wake at night, uh, thinking about monads and stuff. Um, I am not a computer scientist. I will try to avoid lambda calculus. At the moment, there is no lambda calculus in the talk at all. Uh, my background is actually in mathematics, so, um, uh, but I will try to, not, to, to make the talk accessible to a, a wider audience as well. And as I say, as I said, I, I tend to use Emacs Lisp as much as, as possible in the talk. And unless I specified otherwise, so you should be able to see um, all the parentheses and stuff. At some point we will get to, there will be the odd exercise in there that you can do in your spare time. They, I don't think they're particularly simple ones. So it's something we can look at later, but there will also be bits that I call meditations where I'm asking you to think about some aspect of what we have on the slide. And this is where the interaction comes in. Uh, you can choose to interrupt saying, oh, can this be this that thing or that thing? Or have you forgotten something, something? Or you can choose to just think about it, or you can ignore it and just enjoy the, the talk. So the, the bits where you're asked to meditate on something, maybe you want to come back later and you want to have a proper think about it. Um, we can discuss whether I should give my answer to the meditations or, or whether you want to not have it and we can, um, well, some of them will be in the slides, but um, whether you want to go away and think about it. So we'll see how it works when we get to the first one on page 15. So um, enough introduction. So let's get into the, the functional programming principles. 
So for pure functional programming, you need some constraints. One of them is that variables are immutable. So you can declare a variable, but you can't change it once you have declared it. So you're not allowed to use set quote or set uh, or any of the F macros like inc and, and the others. And you're supposed to use recursion rather than loops, because if in a do list, for example, you have a variable that loops across a list. And if you want to not do that, you need to recurse through the list within a function call, as we shall see lots of examples of, because it's a very common pattern. Also, functions are supposed to be called without side effects. At some point in the talk, we shall get to what happens when you need the side effect and when you might need the side effect and what happens when you need side effects. That will be um, a notable feature in the later part of the talk. And um, the other thing is you can actually pass functions as arguments. So you can pass a function into a function as an argument, or you can store a function in a variable or, or some such. And that is all perfectly fine. So functions are not sort of special things that, that need to be treated differently. And also a common pattern is the divide and conquer strategy that you, you will see several times when we get into this. And uh, so this is sort of the high level view that I've tried to, to, to look at as a general set of principles. Then later we will get into some of the more advanced features in functional programming, at least from my perspective and what they look like in Lisp. Because often when people look at functional programming, they will take F-sharp or Haskell or some such. So it's not so much so often that you see the Lisp view, although Lisp is very well suited for this sort of stuff, as you will see. So why, why would you want to do functional programming? First of all, because it's elegant when, when um, well, sometimes it's really elegant, as you will see examples of, I hope you will agree that the, some of the code is really, really beautiful. It's also for correctness that you want to have the, um, uh, well, functional languages will tend to do type checking and, and Lisp to some extent will do that as well, or maybe not so much Emacs Lisp, but um, other Lisps. And we'll get to that later as well, though probably not today. And um, compilers can infer correctness through stronger type checks. So if you have a plus, for example, you know that there are numbers that you're adding and compilers can use that to infer something about what you're trying to do and to see that you're not adding a, a, a string or something using a plus. Also, I think it just makes you a better programmer because you add another string to your um, your um, sort of abilities and stuff, your bro will be, um, I don't know if that makes sense. I think you make, you, it will make you a better programmer. So there are also cases where you may not want to do functional programming. So one of them is inefficiencies that might crop up as uh, compared with the, um, the opposite, the um, imperative, uh, approach where you loop through variables and stuff. So often you will find that there will be temporary lists and, and things created while you're going through some sort of calculation where the, the loop will just go through one thing at a time and there will be no temporary lists created. So potentially the imperative version can be faster and, and, and create less um, const cells, fewer const cells that need to be garbage collected later. And we will see several examples of those as well. The, and, and said quote, obviously, if you're updating a variable that is probably faster than a function call, um, we shall see examples also where it's, it is not faster than a function call, but, um, uh, but usually they are. Also, some patterns can be difficult to do. So if you were trying to do the advent of code, for example, in a functional style, as I know some of you were trying to do, and I was as well, then doing arrays in a functional style can be quite tricky in my opinion. So particularly when you have an, an arbitrary array that you don't know what the, how many dimensions it's got as it's passed in and you want to process it in a very generic way. And common Lisp can do this, but other, languages sort of struggle a little bit with that sort of stuff, in my opinion. So let's look at function calls first. So 
all of this should be familiar to you. This is good old fashioned Emacs Lisp. Uh, the first one you can see Lambda being called. The first part, when you have a list normally that is evaluated, then the first element of the list is a function that is evaluated and called. Usually it's the name of a function, but it could be a Lambda list in itself. And everything else in the list are the arguments that you're going to pass to that function. So I hope all of this is familiar to you. Uh, you will note the phone call, which is um, uh, sort of function call evaluation. So the first parameter passed to phone call is the function that you want to call, either the name or a lambda list or something else. And then everything else on that list are the arguments that you want to pass to that function. So if you look at the example called Fred here, you can see that it calls a function, but it determines at runtime which function to call. So um, you pass it in. If, if x is even, then it returns the square root function. And if not, it returns the, the minus function, just negating the value. And then it calls that on x. And you can see how it, how it. So it sort of decides which function to call at runtime, which is part of the, it's not necessarily the cleanest code, but it's part of the power that you get in functional programming that you can mess around with functions like that. And we'll, we'll see more examples of that. So to do this cleanly, um, the first example that I usually display is the factorial function where you want to, um, you want to calculate the, the factorial of a number. So this is the divide and conquer strategy. You know that uh, the factorial of zero is one, and you know that the factorial of n is n times the factorial of n minus one. So this is basically recursion. It says how to um, how to calculate the value based on another value that is easier to calculate, in a sense. And eventually, the calculation stops at zero, and and um, you you will find that all of these things are put together. There's no loop of k here. It just calls itself twelve times or or whatever in this this thing, and eventually it unwinds the stack and returns the actual value that you get at the end. Uh, so you may, dark, may argue that it should check that n was not less, less than zero. We'll also get to that later, how you, how you might want to do that in a, in a nice functional way without doing it every time. Because if you start with 12, you don't want to check that 12 and 11 and 10 and all of them are less than zero because you know mathematically that if you start from a positive number and you stop at zero, it will never be negative. So in a sense, you want to, if, you, if you're going to check that you're not getting negative numbers or, or garbage into your function, then you want to check that outside of the main calculation so, so the calculation can just proceed as, as cleanly as possible. So factorials are not so interesting, not doing them like that. So I've picked some examples from my ad advent of code which was this year, uh, last year, done in common Lisp. But I thought they were quite, in, um, well, I plugged out obviously some interesting examples that, that I thought might be useful. And because that's a little bit more like a real world scenario where I'm trying to solve some sort of problem using functional programming. So uh, I will make all the references available as well. So you can go and look them up if you should actually want to do so. But um, the point here was um, we were trying to find numbers that increase in a list. And to do that, I take that list, which comes in into the function as data, and I do the, the CDR of the data, which is the rest of the list, so with the, the first element removed. And then I call map count on that with a minus. So the effect of that is that it will, it will subtract neighbor elements from each other and generate a temporary list with those differences in them. And then I simply count how many of those are positive, how many positive differences there are. Now, it turns out, of course, that if I have a list and I have an, a list with the first element removes, then they don't have any, they don't have the same length anymore. But Mapcar happily doesn't care. It will just do whatever is up to the shortest list and stop there. Now, this is a common Lisp example because though Although Emacs has a, has a map car, 
it does not accept multiple lists. It will only accept a single list and a function of one value. Here, I'm, I have two lists and a function, the minus function, which takes two values. So I think this is an example where a common list shows the, the functional programming in a much better way than I would be able to do if I were to only use Emacs Lisp. Here's another example, which is le arguably less elegant, but I'm using the same kind of um, cheating. So we have a window walking through a list. We want to look at the first three elements and the next three elements and so on, all the way through the list. So taking the list and the CDR list and the CDDR list. So that's the list and the list with the first element removed and with the first two elements removed. And then looking at those together and looking at the sum of those and collecting those. So if the input list is n elements long, then the output list will be n minus two elements long because that is the length of the shortest list that, it, that we're passing to Mapcar. So it's just showing how you can solve common patterns because it's quite common to have to examine neighbor elements in lists. And, and this is a cheap and cheerful way of doing it that works really well in common Lisp. It is slightly less elegant in Emacs Lisp if you can only pass one element to Mapcar. But that's kind of an exercise for you to, to, to solve if you want. Another exercise to solve if you want is what if you, what if the number was not just three, but you could pass the number in as well, because then it becomes a somewhat harder to do. Okay, here's another real life example. So I've got quite a lot of those uh, because I think that's kind of interesting ways of, of solving or show how problems are solved with functional programming. So um, I'm also interested in feedback, whether you think, whether you agree with me at the end. So does it actually illustrate functional programming very well, or, or is there some, some better way of doing it? This one is, um, if you did advent of code, you would have seen that there's often a test input that you need to pass in while you find out whether your function is doing the right thing. There's a small example, and then there's a larger example that you read from a file. Doing it in Emacs, I would often pass the small example in as a string, and the, la the larger example would be read into a buffer, and I'm, then I would just run the code on the buffer. In this case, um, the first line says, um, if it's a stream that's coming into my, uh, if the data that comes in is a stream, then I call some kind of solve function on it, which is also passed in. Next, if it's a path name, then it opens the file for reading, and passes and that gets us a stream which I can then call the same function with and then it will do the first branch and finally if, if, if what's passed in is a string as in the test function then it creates another stream from that an input stream from the string and again it calls itself and uh, this time because what's coming in is a stream it will again trigger the first line here so it's, it's kind of a way without doing any loops or go-tos or if then else's um, to just have the main cond splitting up, whoops, splitting the case according to whether, what type the input is. And eventually they will all end up here doing this thing and calling the, the actual solver function on a stream. Now there's a cleaner way of doing that in, in common Lisp, at least there's a type case that I could just say if this if the type of the data is a stream, then call this one. If it's a path name, then call the other one. In Emacs, you haven't got path name as a special type. You will just pass it a string as a path name, but then you can do a, a pattern matching, a regular expression matching, whether it's got slashes in it and stuff or, or, or something to check whether it's a string or a file. Um, so you could do the same thing in, in Emacs as well. So I now want to get into a slightly longer example, which is um, how to create a multiple value, uh, multiple argument function from a two value function. So for the moment, we shall pretend that plus is a, can only add two numbers. 
and we want to create a, a, a plus function that works on any number of arguments. So mathematically, we say if we add zero arguments, then we just get a zero out of it because zero is the identity element for addition. If you pass it one element in, then we just want to return that element because an, one element added to, um, well, nothing is itself, if you like. And if you pass more than one element in, then recursion kicks in and we start doing um, adding A, B, C, and D is the same as adding A to the sum of the rest. So the effect is that we have um, summing A, B, C, and D gives you the, the associativity that you see there. For plus, of course, it doesn't matter because plus is associative. So it doesn't really matter which order you sum them in. But sometimes it does matter. And we'll get into a bit what, if I remember, I'll, I'll mention what happens when it matters. But uh, if we just take that piece of, of maths there and turn it into code. So if you remember, we're using recursion and we're using um, the divide and conquer strategy, we can say if we get zero elements, we do one thing. If we get one element, we do another. And then otherwise we'll be in the general case and we can, we can simplify that by removing an element and, and calling our own function again. So here I've got a function called my plus that takes a list called my list. And it does precisely what we had before. Uh, if, if the list of a, is of length zero, then just return a zero. If it's of length one, then return the, return the first element. And if not, we extract the first element and add it to whatever the sum is of the rest. So this is a very clean pattern. It's functional programming. However, the, this particular piece of code is not very good. And this is the first meditation exercise that you can choose to um, criticize this piece of code and we shall try and work out how we can make it better. So I don't know if you want to pipe up with suggestions before we go any further or whether you want to think about it for about five seconds or, or what you want to do. This is our first meditation. Any suggestions? It seems like we might need a lot of stack frames if we're adding a very long list. Yeah. So um, whenever we get to these meditations, this is I kind of this is what I, I want you to do to try and think about what what's going on here. What how can we make it better? What is what's happening here? And there are several places where we can improve this function, as we'll see in the next few slides. So the things I found with this is the usability, first of all, because uh, when we call it, I need to pass it a list. And what I actually want to call it is passing it just the arguments that, that it's supposed to, to add up. The second is efficiency, that th this length function is called, and it's actually very much, it, it calculates the length of the list. And calculating the length of the list can only be done by adding essentially walking through the list and finding out how long it is. And I don't need that. I just need to know if the list is empty or if the list has one element in it. So using the length function is, is quite inefficient. The other thing is a correctness issue that uh, because it calls itself, if I pass it a list of a million elements in and say, please add up these numbers, it will fail because it's sort of gonna run out of stack at some point. So in a, product, in a piece of production code, you want to make sure that doesn't happen because you don't know how much space you've got left on the stack. So you don't know how many numbers you can add because the, number, the length of the list that you can add in this particular code is determined by how much space you've got left on the stack because every time it calls itself, it creates a new stack frame and tries to loop through. And because it needs to remember this bit, then um, while it's doing the other stuff, then it needs to have that somewhere on the stack until the result of the final calcula calculation has come through. And we'll see later how to fix that. Um, at least um, 
sometimes how we, we can sometimes fix that. And then finally, um, if you know anything about computing and numbers and stuff, then adding floating point numbers just like sort of naively is probably not a good idea because of precision and loss of precision and, and kind of stuff. Although we'll ignore that in this talk. So here's a better version. First of all, there are there should be precisely four differences compared to the previous one. So if we pop back to the previous one, this is what it looked like. And now we go to the next one and you can see what it looks like. So it's kind of doing the same thing, but there's now a rest up there. And there's an apply here. And you can see more simply it's using NP instead of the length. If we do the NP first, because it's slightly simpler. Um, so NP just says, check for the end of the list. So if my list is empty, then just return zero. Now, if you remember, CDR took the rest of the list. So if it's not empty and the rest of the list is empty, then there must be only one element in the list, in which case I wanted to return the first element of the list. Otherwise, it picks up the first element and it waits as before, and then it calls my plus on whatever is left in the rest of the list. So. This now fixes two of the things. First of all, it makes it enables me to call this bit, as we'll see in a moment. And it also fixed the um, I'm no young, I'm no longer using the length function. So it, at least the NP is much, 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 much cheaper than the end function. Because it doesn't, the length function must walk to the end of the list. And it the list could be very, very long. So um, NP will just look at what it's got and saying, is it nil? And if it is, then it returns true. And if it's not nil, then it doesn't. So rest says, take all the arguments to the function call and put them into my list. So the effect of that is I can call the function like this. And my list will be the list of arguments to the function in a list. So this allows me to in introduce variable uh, uh, functions with a variable number of arguments because everything will just be captured in a list. So um, this is one of the, the, the list power tools. It lets you introduce um, uh, the, the, the way the Lambda expression is written, the way the arguments are written in the Lambda expression. It lets you capture everything that is not named and it will just cheerfully put that into a list and you can do with it whatever you want. And in this case, of course, we extract the first element and then we call the function on the rest. However, the corollary of that is that I must use apply because now rest my list is itself a list and I want to call the my function on it. So I can't just call it directly because if I, only, if I pass the list to my plus, then it only gets a single argument, namely the list. And I want to apply it to that. So it takes, um, it, it sort of deconstructs that list and puts the my plus function at the head of it, if you like, and then evaluates that. So we'll see more examples of how apply works, the, the magic of apply, because it, it is a very, um, one of the power tools for functional programming in Lisp. Um, what is the why the rest and the definition is called with the ampersand? Is that ah yeah, it's a very good question. So they are totally unrelated. The the rest here is totally unrelated to the rest here. They they're not even remotely the same thing. Okay. So so the uh, so it's a very good question. Um, we shall see more examples of these things for the ampersands. Um, there are, there's a smallish number that has supported in Emacs Lisp and a larger number in Common Lisp. So the rest here is just a, a normal function that takes a list and then removes the first element and returns the same list. Obviously, the element is not actually removed. It, is, it just steps to the next element and returns that. So it's exactly the same as CDR, if you know that one. The, the rest here, 
says to take it is completely unrelated to the the list it, it kind of in a in a way even does the opposite so it takes all the arguments and structures those into a, a new list that is passed into your function so there's a bit of inefficiency here if you like so, because it must create a temporary list to hold the arguments to the function that um, when i call the function like this then the rest with an ampersand will take those four values and put them into a new list. It is probably a new list, I expect, although it could actually just return a pointer to the first one here. Uh, because this itself, this function call itself is a list. Um, and then it passes that into the function. So the effect is to, to create a list as if it created a list with all the arguments to the function inside it. So don't get confused with the name that the name of this is similar to the, to the name of that. They do completely different things. This thing rest here is not a function. It is a, it's probably called something, but it's kind of like a keyword saying, it's not actually a keyword, but I can't remember the exact name of what it is, but it, it's, it's saying something about the, the type of parameter that I have got in my Lambda list. And we'll see other examples of that because the other one is ampersand optional, where it says um, this thing may or may not be given when you call the function. Okay, so um, there's more things to meditate on here because there are, there are, there's another more subtle and, and perhaps less important performance related issue which goes back to the factorial I mentioned before. If I want to check for a number less than zero, then I don't have to check that every time once I know that I'm starting from 12 and I'm counting down to zero. Uh, and the same thing happens here. If the list is empty, then yeah, I'll just return zero. If the list is not empty, I'm never gonna call my plus on an empty list because well, eventually this thing will, will, okay, suppose I start, I call the plus function on a list of length three. So it's going to co come into this branch and take one element out and then call my plus on, a, on the remaining two elements. So now the two elements come into the function and it goes into this piece of code as well and says, are you a single element list? No, I'm not. So it goes into this branch again and strips off the first one and it leaves the second one, um, you know, so, so rest my list in that case will just have length one. Then it calls itself again and it will say, are you an empty list? No, it's not because it has one element in it. That's one element left. And then it goes in there and says, are you a single element list? Yes, you are. So it will return that element that's in that list. So if the list is not empty, when I call my function, it will never be empty. It will work all its way down and the stop condition is that the list has one element in it and then it'll just return that and that return values go back, goes back and it'll collapse all the additions as we saw in the, the, the maths bit. So if I really cared about this sort of stuff, I could factor this out. I could say my function is given a list of, of of arguments. And if it's empty, return zero. Otherwise, call a helper function, which sums values in a non empty list. And then the non empty list looks exactly like before. Does it have one element in it? Then we'll just return the first element. And if not, then um, it recurses like we had before. So the fact is that this thing, checking for an empty list is only done once and everything else runs as, as before. So this bit is actually very slightly faster than the other bit that we had before. Because um, I know NP is very cheap. It's much, much cheaper than calling the length function, but there is only sort of logically, I only need to check for an empty list once 
I can only get an empty list once. Otherwise, as I work through my function, it will go from n to n minus one to n minus two down to one, and it stops at one because I check for, for lists of length one. So this is kind of, I've gone into this in, in a little bit of detail because to me, this is part, part of the power of functional programming. Because I have these, this piece of logic that I had on my maths page, and I translate that into code, and I can reason about that code, how it works. So you get the same thing in, in the more procedural part of the programming where you have loop invariants and stuff. But to me, it is now cleaner because I do it functionally because they are now function invariants that my plus can get any list, including lists of length zero. The helper function can get any non-empty list. This is actually not entirely true, but, but um, there's a, you, you could, there, there is an edge case that, um, but, but logically it is, it is true that it gets any non-empty list and it tries to sum whatever is in that list. It may explode if the list is too long, but that's a different issue. So, so it, it, it's again part of the divide and conquer approach in functional programming. And to my mind, it's, it's cleaner because it's the function that encapsulates the logic constraint rather than a block of your code with a loop invariant. So it is true that I haven't dealt with the correctness issue, but I'm not able to do that yet. So we'll get to that later. As I say, uh, as I said, I don't really care about um, the order in which you add the numbers, although you should care about it if you add lots of numbers of different sizes and stuff. Uh, we will get to the correctness, the, the stack stuff later. Now, this whole exercise was just to show what how you build an binary plus out of a binary plus. Of course, you don't have to do this because Emacs plus is already in binary. You can call plus on no arguments at all and it will cheerfully return zero. So the first one is the first function call, uh, where like a, a function call would normally, what it would normally look like. The second one is the apply. As we saw before, when you apply plus to a list, the effect is that of calling the function on the, on the elements of the list, as if these elements were arguments to the function. We have the, the fun call, which references the function plus. Um, so I use the hash quote to say this is a function. Um, hash quote is actually a reader macro that says function. And this is more important in common lists because they have a different namespace for functions. Um, so variables and functions have different namespaces, which is why they call Lisp twos. Emacs is a Lisp one, so it's not so important in, in Emacs, but I still like to do it because it, it shows you as you read this code that I'm, I intend to refer to plus as a function. And we've got reduce as well, which um, is from the MapReduce paradigm that um, it just reduce, reduces the list it's given with the plus function. And as ever, as before, we could have plus stored in the variable and it will cheerfully call the fun call and it will cheerfully call apply and reduce. It's just the first one that will not work. So if, if I bind the variable plus to the value of the plus function and, and I type plus inside the parentheses like that, the call will fail because it will argue that plus is a variable and not a function name even though there's a function stored in the variable. So you need the fun call to make it work. Okay. Uh, one thing I want you to meditate on, if you, were, if you like, is why this thing seems to do the same as that thing. Because they appear to be completely identical. So what's the difference? Um, I can't remember if I got that on the, I haven't got it on the second slide. So 
um, you you can meditate on this question, or we will uh, get to it later when we return to the reduce function. Right. Here's another piece of code from advent of code. Um, so again, I'm extracting that because I'm sort of trying to solve real life problems. And I'm sort of trying to do things um, in obviously in a functional style, but I'm also trying to highlight both the benefits and the disadvantages of the functional style. So it, to, to paraphrase this, what I just said is essentially that um, when the functional code is short and elegant, um, well, if, if it's short and functional, it's usually elegant, but it's also sometimes inefficient. So if you look at what's happening here, this was reading stuff from uh, a set of, I think it was a set of lines that were read. And I was trying to read to determine whether all the lines had the same length so I could turn them into an array. Uh, because an array, obviously, um, when you have a two-dimensional array, you must have all the bits that you put into that array must have the same length because it's a two-dimensional array. So, so this was just a sanity check that it hadn't skipped any, anything in one of the sequences that it read. So it's calling the length of every sequence and it's giving me a temporary list with the lengths in it. And then it's applying the equal sign on it, which is also an array function. So I could call equal on as many numbers as I like and it compares them with each other and it returns true if and only if they're all the same number. So this does precisely what I want, but it has some inefficiencies in it. Now, again, this is your meditation exercise. Um, what are these inefficiencies and how can, do they matter at all? And in this case, they don't matter because I was just reading stuff off a, a, a file and turning them into an array. And there would be other things that would be much more inefficient in that process than, than what I'm doing here. Um, so imagine, for example, that the first two sequences are different and I have a hundred sequences. So the, my function is going to call length on all of those sequences, all the hundred sequences. And at some point, it gets numbers, but the first two numbers are different. So the equality comparison will always fail, regardless of what's in the rest of the, uh, of the sequences. So you could argue that this is inefficient and it would be much more efficient to, um, to not calculate the rest of the lengths once you know that the equality call will fail. So, your exercise, um, should you wish to do one, is to implement that in a functional style. For, for extra credit or bonus points or, or something. So um, you want to have a, a function that is passed in a number more than two or more lists or two or more sequences, and it returns true if all of those sequences have the same length, but you want to improve on the inefficiencies that you can see here. So as I said, in my case, the efficiencies didn't really, um, didn't really matter because I was just reading them once. They're, they're not inside a loop or anything. And, and constructing the array is probably much more expensive, but, um, but it's just something like as an exercise to get your, your head around how to do this in a functional style. Meanwhile, we will move on to something else. So if you remember back at the beginning of the talk, I mentioned these principles of pure functional programming. And it was that functions are called and they have no side effects. However, now that we're talking about efficiencies, we also need to talk about side effects. So if you look at this thing, um, again, this is real production code from, from the same exercise, I think, somewhere in the um, advent of code. Uh, 
it's taking an integer and splitting it into digits. And you can do that base 10 or base 16 or, or whatever, passing in, um, um, passing in whatever you want, really. Uh, so you split an integer into the digits, and it does that by creating a helper function. So if you go back to the my plus that I had before, which was uh, here, I put the helper function there as a, as a separate function. You can choose to put the function inside. So labels basically declares the helper function locally. So it's just declared lexically to live inside of my function called integer digits. And it creates a helper function called idig for this um, particular thing, which can see these parameters. Unhelpfully, I have called this n again. Uh, because it's called n here, which is, um, I think, confusing, and I should probably have fixed that. It works, but it's just confusing if you don't know what's going on. This n is actually different from this n, because it shadows it. The, this n lives inside of the function, and it, it shadows the n that is being passed in as an argument to the function. So this n, inside of the recursive function that I've declared here, it accesses this n, but this base variable. And you can see what's happening inside the function. It's saying, is my digit, is my number lower than the base that I'm trying to split it off? If yes, then just return a list of, of the number. If not, then calculate the quotient and the remainder and put those together. Just call it recursively, take the remainder, and uh, then whatever is left in the quotient, just call the function again, keep splitting it until we get to the end. So if, if you think about this, the, so the end that's visible here is the end that's, that is there. And I call the function here. So labels de declares a function locally, which can call itself. So if you're familiar with flat, which declares a local function, the difference between flat and labels is that, um, flat maybe I should say, um, flat creates a local function, but it's not allowed to call itself recursively. If you want a function that can call itself recursively, which you usually do when you want functional programming, then you need to use labels. Why they have completely different names, um, this is just lost in the history of, of Lisp. This is just um, one of those things. Anyway, so we call the function, it returns a list of digits, but it returns the list of digits backwards. So I need to reverse it. As you probably know, there are two reverse functions in Lisp. There's uh, uh, one called reverse and there's one called end reverse. The difference is that end reverse is destructive. It takes a list and reverses it, but it uses the elements of the list, the const cells that you already have. So it has a side effect. It destroys its argument. And if you remember, you would say, actually, functional programming is not supposed to destroy its argument when you call them. So why are you using n reverse? Why is it safe? It is safe because I've called in calling this idic function, I create the list as a result. I know that nothing else is using that list. It is created here with the list and with the cons that constructs the list as idic calls itself. So it is perfectly safe for me to destroy it and you know just reverse it destructively because the value that was created by IDIG is not used by anything else. And arguably, it is better for me to use n reverse because if I used reverse, it would create a new list with the reverse digits in it. But it will, it will then have to garbage collect the list that came out of the, the function call of the, the subordinate function. Does that make sense? 
So because I have a list that I know is not created, not used by anything else, I, it is safe for me to call the function that destroys the list and return whatever that returns. So this function is functional and it's safe, even though it uses a, a, a function call that has side effects, because I know that the side effect has no effect on the validity of the function. In fact, I know it is better because it avoids the creation of another list of the same length, which is what I have summarized here on the slide. So if you go back and read the slides, um, you can see um, I have tried to summarize um, this, what I just mentioned about this. Uh, the other thing, the other thing to mention is that in, in common Lisp, you, you will find that the floor function can do both the, the modulus and the remainder. Uh, they are returned as multiple values. Emacs doesn't do multiple value return types. So, so we are out of luck there. We have to use both floor and mod. So most of the functions that have these side effects have an N in front of them. So N reverse, N, uh, ooh, I can't remember any others. Um, I'm sure there are loads, um, but some of them do not. So um, sort, destroy their arguments in, in general, delete, and um, yeah. But, but as, a, as a general rule, they should have an N in front of them. The, um, if there are two distinct versions, then the destructive one should be named as the non-destructive one, but with an N in front of the name. So um, let's go back to this again. Um, so the, the inverse of that integer digits, if we want to take those digits and can, can collapse them back into uh, an integer, um, it's, it just looks like this. We go back to our, our happy reduce function and you can see that it, it takes the one digit and multiplies by whatever the, the base is and they're adding the next digit and it just keeps doing that over the digits. And this cheerfully works as it goes along and returns two, three, four, five in our example. And I mentioned that partly because it's the inverse problem of, of turning digits back into an integer. And that's also quite easy to do in a functional style. And also to give you the answer to the question of, of why reduce and apply, whoops, why reduce and apply are different here. Reduce uses a binary function as it calls this thing and then calls them pairwise. So adding up stuff like we did with the, the n array plus, like, like we did with my plus. So it calls the pairwise function across the list, accumulating results as we go along. Whereas apply applies the function to the whole lot in one go, which works because plus is, um, doesn't care. It just takes as many arguments as you give it and, and sums them up. So, so they give the same result in this case, but logically they do different things. So reduce here is really just given a binary function, which also uses this bit. And then it just calls it rep repeatedly until it runs out of digits and returns the result. So some things to ponder when you think about these, uh, what happens if the list is of length one or length zero, what happens to reduce then? As we saw with the plus, or even in my plus, we had special cases for length zero and length one. So what happens in this case? Um, so I'll let you type this into Emacs um, when you get the slides and you can, you can see what it does. The other thing to ponder is whether I can express the constraint that the digits must be between zero and base. So if my base is 10, I want all my digits to be between zero and nine inclusive. And is there a way for me to express these constraints? Because if they are not, if, they, if it doesn't hold, then in a way the result that I get will be nonsense. 
the other thing to note is that reduce is actually uh, what you might call polymorphic. It works on sequences, not just lists. So sequences are arrays or vectors and lists, but also strings. So here I call it on a string, and this is again perfectly valid Emacs Lisp. Uh, so the, to base 100, what would be the string A, B, C, D, B? In fact, it, I think it doesn't work in common Lisp at all. Uh, it won't work in common Lisp. So Emacs Lisp treats letters as integers. So A would be uh, 65. I think. So you can see it has reconstructed the string. A is simply treated as 65, and B is 66 and 67 and 68. It's just put them together. And because it's using base 100, it will cheerfully just put them together two digits at a time and, and reconstruct the number. This will not work in common Lisp because a character is a separate type in common Lisp. Um, but this is a, a sort of an example of, of how um, the sequence functions can be quite powerful in Lisp that they can just, if they work on sequences, then uh, there's no reason why they shouldn't. Like they don't have to just be lists. Sometimes you can just use vectors and stuff. Okay, let's take a look at the time. Oh, it's five o'clock. So um, by definition, I think we should wrap up here. I hope um, you got something out of that.